Hello there, my name is Mark Simpson and today we're going to be talking about principles of graphic design and introduction to strategies of visual communication. This presentation is broken up into three broad sections. The first is an overview of the theories and principles of graphic design. In the second section we'll look at some digital workflows and the information that you're going to need to know when working with graphic design in a digital environment. And the third and final section will be a quick tutorial in Microsoft PowerPoint on strategies for improving the readability of charts and graphs. So, design theories and principles. The first question we should ask is, what is graphic design? And graphic design is broadly defined as the art of visual communication through the use of text, images, and symbols. But what does that really mean? There are generally thought of to be three major aspects to graphic design. The first is layout, uh, or in other words, how text images and photographs are arranged on a page. Uh, the second is color. Uh, color can do a lot to communicate uh, the overall tone or mood of some graphic design project. And the third and often overlooked part is typography, which is the selection of typefaces. Um, so not only if it's serif, sans serif, but how chunky it is, how light it is, uh, it's also something that can sort of very subtly communicate a, a, a mood of a project. And so just some things to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, whenever you're starting a graphic design project, it's really important to know your audience and the goal of what the piece is. Um, there's a big difference of if a project is going to be on a poster or a postcard or on a billboard or a pamphlet or a slideshow at a you know, academic conference. Before you start anything, you need to know who you're going to be delivering this message to and how it's going to be represented. Secondly, good graphic design is all about good communication. And as a graphic designer, you're going to be using order and clarity to make information that can be really complicated really simple to understand. And finally, one thing that I think uh, for novice designers is the feeling that you don't know what looks good or when it does look good. And I'm here to say that you can build a kind of design intelligence or intuition through practice. So it's always a good idea just to work on some projects to try things out. And uh, over time, you'll start to develop um, you know, a, a real sense of taste of what looks good and what doesn't. I've broken down the key rules and concepts into six uh, broad categories, uh, balance, proximity, alignment, contrast, white space, and keeping it simple. And I, I think if you adhere to these six principles, as I'm about to explain them, you'll have great success in your graphic design projects. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is balance, which is the visual weighting of objects on a field. Uh, the first type of balance is symmetrical balance. And so here we have three rectangles uh, organized vertically. And you can see that they're centered. They're equally spaced. Uh, it has a, a, a real sense of um, yeah, overall uh, balance and order that is, can be uh, thought of as very pleasing to the eye. You have to be careful sometimes with symmetrical balance because if you do it too much, sometimes it can come across as being kind of banal and boring. But it's a really good starting off point is just to keep everything symmetrical. Asymmetrical balance uh, is also a viable strategy. And in this case, we have these two vertical rectangles with three little horizontal rectangles. And so while it's obviously weighted to the left side, it creates this kind of tension. It's important to keep in mind that Actually, the three triangles, or I'm sorry, rectangles on the right side are still adhering to the overall proportions of the other rectangles. So even though uh, they're different, they're still working within an existing framework. Uh, and so it's important to keep in mind that if something's asymmetrical, it's not necessarily chaotic. You're just creating a bit of tension by uh, distorting or modifying the relationship between objects on a page. But it's not just, it's not utter chaos. Finally, radial 
balance is another great strategy when you're designing or uh, create working on a project. Uh, you can order things radially around a center point. Um, it can be quite distinct from a, a balanced or an asymmetrical organization and, and can be really eye-catching. So keep that in mind. Proximity. So proximity is the grouping of and shaping of objects on a page and keeping like things together and unlike things separate. And so what that looks like is um, here are just some like abstracted forms on the page, but you can see that by putting the lines next to the lines and putting these hexagons next to the hexagons and this in get the concentric circles within each other, it becomes very uh, clear uh, that there are three different groupings uh, and, and they're like that because they're next to each other. And, and this would be reading much differently if uh, everything was just spread out over the page and there was no overarching order. So when you're working with any uh, graphic design project, you're going to want to keep similar things together and, and different things apart, or at least to be conscious of it. Alignment is a really key, key concept to good design. It's about all about keeping objects in line with one another. And so here we have some objects on a page, and, and they're kind of just strewn about um, kind of lazily. There wasn't a lot of attention to detail. There's no real order. Uh, none of the edges are aligning, and you can see that the center uh, vertical rectangle is, there's different spacing between the horizontal elements to the left and to the right, um, so it's just, uh, it's just kind of all over the place and looks really disordered. So the easiest way to bring order to a layout on a page is to put a grid on it, and then to snap all of the objects to the grid. And so what that does is it aligns all of the edges and keeps everything equidistant and spaced. And so what's really nice about this is that even after we take away the grid lines, it just looks much more ordered, much more controlled. There's a sense of uh, uniformity uh, in this arrangement of objects that wasn't there before. And I think that in any design project, any graphics project, you want to avoid the appearance of having made arbitrary decisions. And so anytime you can uh, put order onto a thing, you should. And one of the quickest and easiest ways to do that is just to use a grid to keep everything organized and in line. Contrast is the next concept, and that's the concept of creating distinction by highlighting differences. And these differences can be in many different forms. You can have different weights of text between a bold and a light. You can have different shaped objects, a big object versus a little object, or even a, a color. You can have something that's full or something that's empty. And by using contrast, it allows you to create uh, distinctions between objects. So if you're organizing things on a page, by, uh, by creating these differences, um, they become highlighted. And our, our, our eye just really snaps to it and immediately recognizes that these two things are different. And you don't even have to use any words or any text to communicate that idea. White space, which is also known as the art of nothing, uh, is the idea that not everything on the page needs to be filled up. It's okay to have some void spaces, to have some empty spaces, to give some breathing room to your work. Um, so, and here's another example where our eye reads the triangle on the page, even though the triangle doesn't actually exist. Like there is not a triangle that's drawn on the page, but by seeing the three points, and because they're in line with each other off the center points of these circles, our eye jumps to make the assumption that, that there is a triangle there. And so this is important to keep in mind when you're laying out things like charts or graphs um, or text boxes. There probably isn't a need to put everything in a distinct box. I think that the often there's a this impulse to just uh, give everything a thick, heavy border in order to delineate sections. And I think that there are opportunities for other strategies and how you arrange objects on the page so that the edges and borders are implied. You don't necessarily have to, to draw them in order to communicate them. And then I, I like to show this as an example of a really successful use of white space. This is a, a Volkswagen ad from the 60s. And you can see that they're, they're really using all of that white space to their advantage to to highlight how small the car is. So you have this one object drifting in this 
sea of void. Uh, and it's it's really effective, and, and I think it, it reinforces this notion that to have a good graphic design project, you don't necessarily have to fill up the page uh, with content. It's, it's perfectly acceptable and, and sometimes preferable to have some breathing room so it becomes very 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 clear and uncluttered and just not not busy so so don't be afraid if there's if you're laying something out and there's an empty space and you don't know what to do with it sometimes it's okay just to leave it blank uh, leave some breathing room and finally keep it simple uh, this could be the mantra to live by in any graphics design project you want to avoid overwhelming amounts of colors or objects give some breathing room on the space, or give some breathing room on the page. And you should always be asking yourself, what am I representing and how am I representing it? Uh, who is my audience and how are they going to receive or infer what I am suggesting to them? Um, and so sometimes this means that you can simplify the data or the objects that you're representing to, to just what really matters to your audience. You don't necessarily have to include all the details if including all the details means that your main items become uh, inscrutable and unrecognizable. And finally, that's a related point is you should winnow away superfluous information and details, particularly if you're working in a poster or a printed media or a slideshow where you have a limited amount of time, you have a limited amount of space, you really need to think about the being a good editor and paring down your information distilling it so it becomes very clear and very concise. Okay, let's move on to digital workflows. We're going to be talking about some of the tools that, that we use and the, and the rules that apply to working in a, in a digital workspace. So the first thing we'll talk about are software suites. Uh, there, there's two main software suites we're going to talk about today. The first is Adobe Creative Suite, which is the industry standard for pretty much all design work, graphic design work. Uh, the three we're going to be covering here today are Adobe Illustrator, InDesign, and Photoshop. Uh, these programs are, they really set the bar for uh, graphic design projects, and anyone who does any kind of graphic works is, is very well versed in these programs. So if you're interested in doing this kind of stuff, you should really invest the, the time to learn it. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Microsoft PowerPoint only because it's the most ubiquitous graphics program out there on the on the market. Uh, it's the default slideshow presentation in Microsoft Office and it can be used not only for slideshows but also for printed materials as well. Um, the interface tends to be a little bit clunky, the options are limited, but because it has that wide uh, acceptance and uh, usage, you're much more likely to find uh, other professionals on your team who know how to use PowerPoint but don't know how to use Creative Suite, so it's a good idea to really know how to work with that program and uh, get the most out of it. So let's talk about these different programs. Adobe In InDesign is a program that is for layout of print documents and presentations, so it's, it's perfect for things like booklets, posters, slideshows, um, anything where you're laying out objects, art, text, photographs on a page and you're trying to arrange it into a file format that you know the dimensions of. So if you know that you're working with a letter size page or a screen size, uh, InDesign is probably the pro program for you. This is in contrast to a program like Adobe Illustrator which is a vector graphics and illustration program. Uh, this is much more versatile for working with graphics projects where you don't know the final format of the thing you're working on or the thing that you're working on is going to go into a, a report or a booklet or on a poster. Um, so things like maps, uh, logos, charts and graphs, uh, any kind of like plans or architectural drawings are going to be in a vector format uh, because they're very versatile, they're infinitely scalable and can be transferred for easily from one, one program to another. And finally, the, the last one we're going to talk about is Adobe Photoshop. Um, this is probably the most popular of the programs within the Creative Suite. And as the name implies, it's for manipulating and editing photos. 
It's good for renderings, mockups, uh, enhancing images, changing images. So if you take a, a, a photograph uh, and you need to enhance it or improve it, edit it in any way, Photoshop is your program. And finally, Microsoft PowerPoint. As I said, probably the most popular layout program in the world. And it has a limited options and kind of a clunky interface and a lot of the default settings are just totally bogged down. Um, so it can be kind of frustrating to work with sometimes if you're looking to do really simple layout and design. But as I said before, because it's so ubiquitous, it's a good idea to know how to work with this program because it's highly likely that other people you're going to be working on uh, projects with are going to know how to use PowerPoint, but they won't know how to use Adobe. So it really behooves you as, the, as a, a graphic designer to know, know how to work with these programs. Okay, so file management. Might not be the most uh, exciting topic, but it's important to understand. I think of files in two broad, ca broad categories working files and finalized files. Uh, your working files are native to the program that you're working with and these are the files that store all of the necessary workflow information like uh, the metadata, uh, text, photos, your document properties, things of that nature. And then your finalized files are what are exported from the working files. So when you're working with a program like an InDesign or an Illustrator, you're going to have your working file that, that you are going to be editing or you are going to be working with. And then when you're done working with that project and you need to export it, you're going to, you're going to convert it into a finalized file. And that will allow you to send it off to anyone with a computer and they'll be able to, to see your work as you've intended to display it. So here are the different programs with their different working files and their finalized files. Uh, with InDesign it's INDD uh, or IND, INDL which is for um, templates uh, and you're, you'll export as a finalized file as a PDF. Uh, and then Illustrator has AI uh, and that gets exported in, in many many different ways. JPEG, PDF, SFG, EPS just to name a few. Uh, Photoshop is a PSD and you can export into uh, uh, many different types of finalized files like a JPEG or a TIFF or a PNG. And then finally PowerPoint has a working file of PPT or PPTX and you want to export that as a PDF or a JPEG. And, and the reason particularly with PowerPoint why you want to be exporting it uh, in a finalized file format is because if you send a working file to someone not only can those files become really big and unwieldy in terms of size, but also in order for all of the information in your PowerPoint file to be displayed correctly, the person who's opening your file has to have all of the same typefaces, all of the same settings, and if anything changes, it can change what your, what your uh, typefaces look like, what your alignment looks like, everything can go haywire. Versus when you export something into a finalized fo file format, it sort of becomes like fixed and frozen in time and universally viewable regardless of the program that the person is the that you sent it to is viewing it in. So always, 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 whatever program you're working with, always send and uh, work with finalized files when you're when you're exporting them to someone else. Colors are really important when you're working in a digital environment. There, there are two main color profiles that are used in most graphic design projects, CMYK and RGB. Uh, CMYK is generally used for print projects and RGB is used for anything that's on a screen or on the internet that just doesn't get uh, printed into the real world. Uh, and it's important to keep your color profiles consistent in order to avoid any nasty surprises. And what that means is if you're working with a CMYK file, like something that you're going to be printing, and you bring in something from an RGB color space, that RGB color might translate differently. And so when you print the thing, it's going to look different than how it looks on your screen because your screen can display both, but when it, in that translation into a, a CMYK, uh, it might change dramatically. So it's always a good idea if, if you're working in CMYK to keep everything in CMYK, and then conversely, if you're in RGB, just keep everything RGB. So here we have CMYK cyan, magenta, yellow, black, used primarily in print projects, versus RGB, which stands for red, green, blue, 
which is used primarily in screen projects. So any like digital, if it lives on the web, if it's just going to live in email, it's not going to be printed, just stick with RGB. There are two types of digital artwork, uh, vector artwork and raster artwork. Uh, vector artwork is infinitely scalable and is used mostly in, in things like logos and uh, architectural drawings. Uh, it's very handy because it is infinitely scalable. You can take it and it will look the same if it's on a business card or if it's on a billboard. And then by, ca by contrast, raster artwork is pixel-based and it's used primarily in photographs. So let's look at these two. So here we have an example of a vector and so you can see it's all smooth edges with fills. Uh, there's no jagged edges um, or sawtooth, a sawtooth look at any, any, of, any of the divisions between colors. And that's because vectors are con consist of points and paths that have a proportional relationship. And so what that means is when you draw a curve in a vector, the actual distance between the points isn't as important as the relative distance between the points and the curvature of the path. So what that means is that the, the, the line that you draw, because it's like a proportional mathematical relationship, if you double the size, it just doubles the distance between everything. So it's infinitely scalable, very flexible, uh, and it's primarily used in Illustrator, a little bit in InDesign. And then put this in the contrast with a raster, which is a flattened image consisting of pixels. And so you can see here how there's a jagged uh, sort of sawtooth look around all of those edges. And that's because when you're working with rasters, uh, it's effectively a grid of pixels where each little square has its own color value. And that color value is fixed in space. So what that means is, is as you scale uh, that pixel grid up and down, the, the size of the pixels will change, but not their relationship to each other. Uh, and so if you zoom in too much, you're going to get this like real pixelization um, so it's, it's used primarily for photos, any, any print program, once you move away from a digital environment into a, a printed format, it will convert your vector artwork into a raster. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're, when you're working with print. If you're working with low res images, it can get you in trouble. So let's talk about that now. Image resolution. It is incredibly essential that any image you use in any project has the necessary resolution to be crisp and clear. What that mean? That means that for a print project you want a 270 DPI which stands for dots per inch or sometimes you'll see it as PPI which is points per inch or 72 DPI for screen. The final size of a image in a print media will be dictated by the number of pixels in the image. So let's take this adorable photo of this kitten as an example. Here it is, really crisp, clean, you can see everything, looks great. But as it gets pixelated, you see it gets really muddied, uh, it becomes hard to see, you lose a lot of the lines, it just, it just looks really bad. And if you put this on your website or a print document, it just looks really amateurish, like you don't care. So we want to avoid this at all costs. So how you compute the necessary pixels is by thinking about or de deciding on the final size that you want the image to be. So if I was designing, let's say, a poster and I wanted to include this image and have it be four inches wide by three inches tall, I would just multiply those numbers by 270 DPI. And that's going to give me the minimum number of pixels necessary in order to print a high resolution image. So for the four inch edge, if I multiply that by 270 DPI, it would have to be at least 1080 pixels. And then by contrast, on the three inch side, if I multiply that by 270, it'd have to be 810 pixels. So in order to have a crisp and clean image that's three by four inches in a printed format, I would have to have no less than 1080 by two set 1080 by 810 pixels. You can always have more pixels, but if you have fewer pixels, what's going to happen is you'll get that pixelization, those sawtooth edges 
that muddy appearance that just looks really amateurish and like you don't care. So always find images that are big enough to fit the format you're looking for. Okay, and so now we're going to transition to a quick tutorial in Photoshop uh, about improving the readability of graphs. Okay, so now that we've reviewed the theories and principles of good graphic design, let's put some of that to work. I made this chart uh, and basically broke every rule that I just explained in the last half hour. Um, so we could see what it would take to pare this graph down and to get it uh, to a place where it would be more attractive and would fit in uh, a report or presentation or what have you. So first thing is never, ever, ever put a background on the graph. It sort of creates this artificial border around uh, the graph. And the thing to keep in mind is that this uh, data set is going to be included in whatever report you're working with. And you're going to want it to blend with the document. And if you have some weird background, um, it's not going to fit. So just double click on the background and then in the solid and the fill, just put no fill. Um, and then also get rid of any other extraneous backgrounds. Uh, a lot of default in... So the next thing is a, a lot of the defaults in Excel have these drop shadows and these color effects. I think these are super distracting and it sometimes makes it hard to read the data if these get like really extreme. So uh, I would definitely get rid of those. So you can just click it and go up here to format and then with these effects like that shadow, just say no shadow and uh, it's a bevel right now, no bevel. Just get it to be like a simple, simple chart. So I'm going to come in here, no shadow, and get rid of that bevel. So the data is just very clear where it sits on the graph. There's no like gee whiz wow, anything that you're trying to do. You just want simple presentation of data, let it speak for itself. Uh, the next thing is you don't need two legends. Uh, your colleagues, anyone looking at this graph, uh, will be smart enough to know that what's on the x-axis corresponds with the color bar, and you don't need this. This is totally superfluous. It takes up a bunch of space, so just get rid of it. The next thing I would say is the vertical and horizontal lines on the graph can be really distracting and tend to be wholly unnecessary because I don't need these vertical lines to separate these bars because the bars are already plenty separated with enough white space. So you can just like click on those, give it a double click and turn those off. Um, yeah, the minor grid lines, you definitely do not need any minor grid lines. Uh, I'm going to get rid of these little guys. And again, I'm just double clicking and then going to the fill menu. Now, these you might want uh, I think you could get away without them, so we'll see what that looks like if I select these guys and double click, no line, like you can still see where these bars are relative to this axis, so it's not entirely necessary, um, but maybe you do want to have them, so if you double click, I would just say dial down the, the brightness of it, so pick a really, really light gray, just so it sort of like melts into the background, uh, that's looks much better already. When you have an axis, uh, like on these verti this vertical axis with these values, we don't need this level of specificity. It's two decimal places is too many. So just double click on that guy and go to your number options over here. We'll let this load. And what we're going to want to do is just crank down the decimal places to zero because you really don't need that. And again, with this, uh, these tick marks on the x and the y axis, I'm just going to really want to dial down that line. Right now, it's a, it's a dark gray. I'm going to make it a very, very light gray. So it's there, but it really starts to recede into the background. So it's not distracting from your data, which is the thing that you really want to not show off. And even for, um, even for these values, I might come in here and uh, see if I can't make those a lighter gray just so they start to they just start to to melt away into the background because the thing that I really want to emphasize is the data points and not necessarily these lines when working with any 
any data or any labels like get rid of your bold have them be all consistent there's no reason to have bold text one or the other um, and then finally with the colors uh, this is too many colors there are four different colors uh, if my survey response was uh, pizza is the best what I might do instead of having four different colors is I might uh, select each of these guys and fill it with uh, maybe like a dark gray color and then when I click on my pizza one I might give that a pizza color so that way it really pops and then I'm just gonna dial this back because it's still even that full black sometimes I find myself oops excuse me sometimes I find myself using um, just grays just a lot of grays and I, I won't even use a black except for the label so now we can see it's very clear at this point I might even get rid of these lines just because it's pretty clear what's happening uh, I don't need to tell the difference if like this is like 29 or 28 versus like 34 or 33. It's just clear that pizza is number one. Uh, and you can actually get rid of this axis entirely if you apply labels directly to uh, the charts. So if you come in here and make a word box, uh, you can define this as, let's say, 34%. And then just put that directly, directly on the label. And so then if I did this for everyone, maybe just for clarity's sake, because it's kind of hard to read that black on the red, I might make this a white. And then I'm just going to hold down the Alt key to make a copy of these guys. And then you can just sort of enter the values for these. And again, this is really quick and dirty. If I was really preparing this for a presentation I would take a lot of time to ensure that all of these were in line with each other that they were centered where they needed to be centered and there you go so now we've taken off all the superfluous information uh, depending on the color palette that I was using in the larger document you know maybe this would be like my main color and then these gray bars could be my secondary colors my typefaces would match the other typefaces I was using throughout the document uh, and so we see it's like it's a huge change and it looks way better and we can compare it to what we were given which was just like which was just a mess uh, really hard to read really super distracting and whereas this is like very clear, tells a story, pizza's number one, uh, it would fit really well in a uh, presentation format. This is really chaotic, there's just a lot going on, uh, it's kind of glaring on the eyes and just like isn't, isn't really easy to read. Um, I would even go into here and say delete and just get rid of that and then shift all these labels over to even further, further make a minimalist chart. Uh, but there's no reason to include lots of information if you don't need it. So, as we said at the at the at the beginning of the presentation, keep it super simple. Only include the information that you need to include, and just know that a clear, simple presentation of data is going to tell a much more convincing story than one that's weighed down by superfluous amounts of information. So, hope this was helpful. Uh, there's lots of other resources available online. If you do a quick Google search or log on to lynda.com, they have a lot of great graphic design tutorials. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful.